we have a very special seminar today. Uh, Matt Myers is uh, a PhD student uh, working on history of left in the 1970s uh, in Europe. Uh, but today he's going to talk about something uh, slightly different, but very interesting. Uh, it was about Jan Walton's memoirs. Uh, also, some various interpretations of those memoirs. Um, thank you very much um, uh, for having me. It's, a, it's an honour. Um, I just as an aside, uh, why I chose this topic. Um, it was through the discussions I've had with, uh, uh, with Ishmael and, and, and others about the role that this book uh, plays uh, for them. I mean, uh, it's a sort of central um, part of reframing their, their own experiences. And it was, your, um, it was your recommendation that put me onto, put me onto the book. Um, so yes, Richard Julius Hermann Krebs uh, was born in uh, 1905 in the Rhineland in Germany, and he died in 1951 in uh, Maryland, USA. Um, he's better known by his alias uh, Jan Valtin, um, under which he authorised, uh, under which he authored the best-selling memoir out of the night, um, which sold millions of copies uh, when it was released uh, in the United States uh, during the start of the First and Second World War. History of interwar communism and of international communism, more particularly, was made up of such transnational characters as Jan Valtin, um, those involved in the Comintern, the Communist International, founded by Lenin, um, as the world party of the proletariat um, to coordinate the world revolution uh, between its foundation in 1919 and its dissolution in 1943, um, will number in the tens of thousands. Um, some passed but a brief time within the organisation, while others remained faithful to their posts as professional revolutionaries. Many, like Valtin, lived a nomadic life, moving from mission to mission, from exile to exile. Um, as Brecht, Bertolt Brecht um, wrote, for the generation of interwar uh, communists, for we went changing our country more often than our shoes, in the class war, despairing, uh, when there was only injustice and no resistance. The testimony of Valtin, a middle-ranking Comintern official and full-time revolutionary, is one of the most extraordinary first-hand sources, um, both of the inner life of, uh, of, the, of the Comintern, um, an extraordinary organisation, uh, and the eyewitness to the revolutionary wave that gripped Europe um, and the world in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, my talk uh, wishes to examine a certain type of political commitment which Jan Valtin um, showed. Um, and took a particular form before the Second World War in the Comintern. Um, communism in this way should be understood as much as a political project as a collective experience involving de a different uh, and particular type of militant uh, practice. For communist militants, commitment was synonymous with finding a key to understanding the world and to make history. Their experiences were fundamentally conditioned by the expectation they had of their commitment. Um, Communism was one of those collective experiences that left its mark on Western societies. Um, in 1968, uh, revolutionaries drew on um, their experiences. Um, communism um, offered membership of a group and with it a social identity. Um, um, as Raphael Samuel um, says of the generation of 1940s British communists, to be a communist was to have a complete social identity one which transcended the limits of class, gender, and nationality. For the French communist writer Paul Nizan, uh, he said, communism is, is a politics, but it's also a style of life. Commitment mean, get, meant giving oneself and working on oneself. As a common term motto, which Jan Valtin notes a number of times, um, goes, there is nothing a communist cannot do. Um, in many cases, the common term militant like Valtin offered uh, was offered a transnational mode of life um, with the opportunity to travel abroad uh, for contact, discussion, uh, intellectual simulation and adventure. Um, uh, the formation of patchwork families um, like Valtin's were, were common as comrades separated and formed new relationships inside the organisation. It transformed um, one's life into, uh, into a global, into an experience globally. Um, um, 
the histo going on to the history of the uh, uh, history of the Comintern, um, the organisation which um, which uh, Bant Baltin uh, committed his life, the historian Franz Bockenau, who left the Communist Party of Germany uh, in 1979, uh, he periodised uh, the Comintern uh, as having three um, three distinct phases. Um, the, in the process, which he calls, um, often it's called Stalinization. Um, first, uh, it was a um, tool to serve the world revolution. Then, um, in the uh, mid 1920s, it became um, factionalized, or it became a tool for certain factional struggles inside the inside the Russian, uh, the uh, Soviet Communist Party, and eventually became uh, an instrument in Soviet foreign policy. This uh, analysis, I think, is. Uh, is, is slightly too is slightly too strong. In fact, there's a number of nuances that we see, especially in the Alvarez's account, which uh, which call into question this periodization. In fact, there are many different uh, individuals that that refuse um, uh, and that show that it's, it's it's slightly more complicated than that, um, especially in its in its later phases. Um, the dissolution of the Comintern in 1943. Marks not only the failure of the most powerful political organisation in the early 20th century, but also the end of a distinct transnational cultural milieu, which uh, yet Baltin was a member and a collective experience it had embodied, um, and to which he had committed most of his adult life. So that is a um, sort of slight background to the organisation that Baltin was 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 a member of. Um, I want to approach Baltin's memoir. Um, um, Focusing on interwar communism as a collective uh, and individual political commitment, um, the characters are passed through the pages of the book. Um, a semi-fictionalized, semi-factual thumbnail sketches of men and women. Um, they're not direct um, representations of the past and of individuals as as as, as they were. And the truth is equally um, more extraordinary and probably less um, and less interesting. The individuals and their hopes, their plans, their dreams are central to the interrogating what life was like um, for full-time revolutionists working under secret conditions um, which members of other of communist parties under uh, under uh, uh, under, see, un, made to, uh, under illegal conditions um, will, will, will note uh, will have experienced themselves in later years. Valentin's keen eye for details of individuals which he came across makes this, makes this task easier. Each, each, each individual uh, tell us about overlapping and something sometimes contradictory forms of political commitment that could exist inside the communist movement at the same moment. These characters are what makes Valentin's book so important. I've selected some of the, of the characters to show the contradictions present in the interwar communist project. Valentin opens his, uh, opens his book uh, with, a, with a discussion of his father, who was a loyal trade unionist, uh, a Nautil part of the Nautil Inspection Service, a member of the Socialist Party of, uh, of Germany, and according to Krebs, uh, he considered the Kaiser a superfluous clown and firmly believed in a just and beautiful socialist future. His mother from Sweden was deeply religious and wanting nothing more than to own a house of her own with a garden. Valentin uh, grows out of uh, the political commitment of his father um, and strides, strides out. What he doesn't mention um, is what happens to his father. Uh, politically, even if his father does, uh, he participates in the, in the German Revolution. Um, and has an instinctive uh, uh, loyalty to um, up to a politics to the left of where the Socialist Party of, of Germany had gone in the First World War. Um, uh, he describes um, how a sailor uh, returned from Petrograd in 19, 1918 uh, with the news of the revolution. Benson writes, he drank great quantities of bad, black, unsugared coffee and talked until he was hoarse. The room was full of people. They asked questions, shook their heads, argued, and many eyes shone. As Valentin observed the, the German Revolution, um, he, he fevered with a strange sense of power. I did not know, he said, what, that this was part of a mass intoxication which had risen from the depths to take charge of minds and events. A republic was declared, and the Kaiser left for Holland, and the armistice was signed. In 1919, the revolutionary camp was split. And a socialist party, a uh, government led by Yebeir, Scheidemann, and Noska, uh, used ultra right parliamentary to murder Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, leading figures of the Spartacus League. Um, it was in this context that, uh, that Baltin joins the uh, Communist Party of, of Germany. Um, and he comes across 
uh, figures like Herman um, Neuflagen uh, in a beer hall in St. Pauli district. Uh, he was the un incarnation of a political adventurer of our century. He talks of uh, Herman as uh, surrounded, singularly well assorted uh, group of revolutionary toughs. Um, Herman radiated an atmosphere of indestructible aplomb, of medium height, of slight build, and a mop of almost colourless hair, his pale eyes gleaming with reckless devilry. He was no more than 22. Early that morning, at the head of his role commando, he had successfully raided the basement arsenal of a counter-revolutionary organised group of armed citizens. The rich must die so the poor may live, he cried. There was nothing bloodthirsty about him as there were for many, of those many around those times. Um, Herman would later go on to, in, to be known in the communist world as the one who was able to smuggle a delegation of the Communist Party of Germany to Moscow when the USSR was closed during the Civil War. He stowed himself and the delegates in a fish tank of an outbound uh, fishing trawler. And once at sea, he emerged from the fish tank with two revolvers in his hands, imprisoned the captain and the crew, took control of the vessel and navigated to Murmansk. The delegation arrived and Herman was uh, known throughout the communist world publicized through its press as a hero, but eventually he was jailed uh, when he returned to uh, Germany for piracy on the high seas, um, out of which the jail he then escaped um, and went to have a successful career in the um, German apparatus party. Um, even more extraordinary figure, Dalton comes across as he uh, becomes unemployed in the, after the revolutionary wave in the early 1920s, he tries to enlist himself on a uh, ship going to South America um, called the Lucy Worman. Um, uh, he registers, um, and in this overburdened ship of hundreds of people that um, have crowded, crowded on, trying to escape the um, um, high unemployment in, in, in Germany at the time, uh, he meets uh, a man called Hermann Cruz, who was an old member of the Spartacus League. Um, and in the ship, anarchy is reigning in the lower, in the lower decks. Um, gangs are fighting, um, people are being murdered and, and, their, and their possessions stolen. Uh, Spartacus uh, League members are forming and, and radical Catholics and socialists are organizing, are organizing meetings and the uh, ship's um, officers have barricaded themselves into the, into the top deck. Um, Crews them. Uh, um, who calls a meeting and forms uh, the ship Soviet on the Lucy Berman that, uh, that Valentin is on. He forms his own checker, the secret police, and he, and by terror, subdues the gangs that have taken over the ship. And this is how uh, Valentin describes Cruiser. Cruiser, about 25 years old, was blonde, beerish, quick-tempered, and had a flair for oratory. He brought some order out of the confusion, and now he demanded control of the ship. The skipper armed his officers with pistols and for the meeting with Cruiser Soviet. By way of retaliation, Cruiser strong armed squads seized all available provisions and began a hunger, blo hunger blockade against the bridge and the engine room. <laughs> Cruiser's plan was to allow the Lucy to pass through the Panama Canal, then overpower the officers uh, for good. After that, the ship was to steam to the Galapagos Islands, establish a Soviet Republic there, and ask Moscow for protection, supplies, and women. <laughs> <laughs> Valtin joins, unfortunately, the opposing faction to Cruiser, uh, which it, um, shrieks at Cruiser. Cruiser wants to be dictator down with the Galapagos. We land right here. He jumps ship and swims to shore, eventually making his way to uh, the United States. Uh, the next extraordinary man that makes a real impression on uh, Valtin's life um, and really commits him to communism is a man called Willy Jim Pat. Simpansky, uh, who meets in the Hamburg city jail after being arrested as a stowaway trying to escape Germany yet again. Uh, uh, this is how he describes him. A fanatic fire burned in his grey eyes. His explosive enthusiasm was contagious. The clear sincerity of his devotion thrilled me. More and more I became convinced then that the dedication to the revolution was the only worthwhile thing in life. A man with us a man can find awareness of his own strength, uh, as Impansky said. His influence on me was so strong, I gripped his shoulder. Great battles in the offing, he said. Uh, the party must prepare the armed uprising. This time we won't be lo losers. Soviet Germany and Soviet Russia will be invincible together. 
he gave me a little bag of a little red book uh, urging me to pass it on before my release from prison. It was a Communist Manifesto. Uh, Valtin writes that he did not see Jim Mansi again until 1932, by which point he had become one of the most efficient operators of the foreign division of the Soviet secret police. Lawyer to the last, he committed suicide in the Nazi prison in 1937. Um, it is out of these, these encounters um, which, make, which make communists, um, um, and this is a very important moment for Valtin. Um, another extraordinary figure he meets is a man called Johnny Detmer, whose reckless daring, Belton writes, could well measure up with that of the pirate heroes of my boyhood. He was a member of the military hundreds of the of Communist Party of uh, Germany and a leading gun and the party's leading gun runner, who smuggled uh, weapons into the, its military apparatus, uh, completing a number of daring missions. Uh, blonde, blue-eyed, and of 24 years old, quick-tempered, clever, and with the strength and the agility of a panther, he was one of those honest political desperados who have been valuable fighters in riots and upheaval, but who come to grief uh, once orderly conditions have been established. Ernst Wallweber, who went on to be uh, head of the um, East German, uh, he was Minister of State Security in East Germany, and plays a really central role in Belton's uh, memoirs, would describe with Detmer, uh, we need men like Johnny to win the fracas, but after the revolution, we've got to shoot them. Um, <laughs> Uh, which tells you more about Ernst Volvo than you do, than maybe it doesn't count. Uh, Detmer. Another extraordinary man that Valtin uh, uh, meets is, goes by the name of Bandura, uh, who is a Ukrainian anarchist uh, he meets in Antwerp and who is the master of uh, the port and organizer uh, of a uh, network of seamen uh, across, the, the, across the world from uh, San Francisco. Um, to, um, to Indonesia. Um, this is how he describes him. He looks the part of a tight-lipped, picturesque brigand, a big-boned, starved-looking man with angular Slavic features. He was a Ukrainian anarchist who carried on the in independent war against all ship owners everywhere. He was the typical representative of those interned uh, waterfront revolutionists. One and all, they were fugitives from the political police of their own lands. Few had passports. Bandura was the undisputed leader of the dockers of Antwerp, moving like an uncrowned king. He was their leader as he lived as they lived, worked as they worked, and still proved himself to be able yeah, in the crew. Um, the Comintern eventually tries to break up Bandura's network because he continues to um, spread propaganda on Soviet ships, um, especially um, the fact that Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, seamen have a right to strike for high pay uh, and better conditions. Um, and Valtin uh, uh, is, is sent to, uh, to break up uh, Bandura's network um, because he's not, he's seen as reliable in the in threat of, in, if war comes um, and the Soviet Union needs, um, needs, it needs its network on seas to be, to be loyal. Um, eventually, though, Bandura does get co-opted into, uh, into the communist movement, into the Comintern, and rises up and plays quite a considerable role uh, in, its, in, its shipping, in its shipping network. Um, um, which Baltin later writes is, is, a, is a large disappointment, was a large disappointment to him. Um, uh, among Baltin's six roommates at the Lenin School, which he attended um, in 1925 to 1926, um, which he was sent. Two died, uh, one was in prison um, uh, at the time of writing. The rest he, he, he lost count of. Um, he also meets an uh, uh, extraordinary uh, Eurasian Bolshevik uh, who tells, told, t tells him about his uh, escape from the Madura Islands, the most famous prison uh, in the Dutch East Indies. Uh, with 600 leaders of the armed insurrection of 1926-1927, which the Comintern had launched uh, in Java and Sumatra. He called himself Voldemar, uh, an emaciated-looking pirate, he, he, Belton describes him. Before his transfer to the Madura, he spent two years in the Diggle River prison camp in the jungle of Dutch New Guinea in harrowing conditions. He had organized a prison mutiny and engineered the murder of several, several prison guards. Um, at Valtin, I had to escort him on his way back to Berlin for another, for another secret mission. Um, Hans, Hans Neumann, who um, 
went on to be uh, quite a se senior figure in the German party um, uh, and was a, was a Reichstag deputy. Um, was a long, long, was a long, long specialist in the art of terror. Um, his, his, his saying about in notes was blood must flow, um, is the Berliner's favorite phrase. Um, uh, Neumann was one of the central figures in creating the illegal military apparatus inside the, inside the party uh, and was very, very keen on, smack, on, on using military means uh, to, to finish na both the Nazis and the uh, Social Democrats. Why not we rid, rid ourselves of this indecent squeamishness, um, the Hitler bandits, the rock-headed Social Democratic saboteurs, which such people um, are useless. Um, uh, Valtin describes Heinz Neumann not as a not representative of a general type of party leader. To a certain degree, he preserved his independence of thought. He demanded discipline but hated it himself, and the keynote of his character was a reckless and brilliant irresponsibility. He had a fine, intelligent face and a ready smile. His eyes were large and cruel. Um, but eventually, um, he calls the socialists uh, are like social fascists. Um, they are left, that left wing of the Hitler movement. Eventually, Neumann was to lose out um, in a factional struggle with the uh, existing communist leadership um, and eventually died in suspicious uh, circumstances um, um, later on, uh, um, before, um, after uh, Belton writes, the, writes his book. Um, uh, so, all these figures that have been, I've, I've mentioned, um, what is interesting about the later part of the book is that the interesting individual figures like Bandura, like uh, Herman, like Cruz, that they start to disappear um, as the as the common term becomes more uh, more centralised and the discipline dis dis becomes uh, more severe. There are no places for people like Bandura or people like Cruz to go on revolutionary escapades to the Galapagos um, anymore. Um, we have to take, uh, and, ho and hopefully that's given you like a taste of some of the stories and why the book is so exciting as a, as a book, and what I think actually it's 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 this thing that can, it's the the element that I think is the most um, exciting about the book is the individual stories that, um, that it tells the specific militant practice of of revolutionaries of all colours. <coughs> um, on the book, the book itself. Um, there is a number of different uh, interpretations of, of the book. None, however, dispute the fact that uh, Jan Beltin, uh Krebs did exist um, and that he was uh, a middle-ranking member of the Comintern. Uh, Mike Jones, in, his, uh, in, a, in an article, Jan Beltin, a false witness, has disputed uh, the accuracy of Jan Beltin's account. Um, to accept the book as historical fact requires an I a degree of ignorance and naivety of great proportions, uh, Jones writes. Not only did the book get the blessing of the FBI, the F uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, when it came out in, in, in America, but it was ghostwritten by a professional anti-communist called Isaac Don Levine, um, who'd also brought out um, a series of other Cold War texts. Um, it had mass massive media advertising, extracts were serialized when it came out, uh, in editions of Life magazine, you know, summarised in the March edition of Regis Digest. Um, <coughs> one of the central personalities of the book, um, more importantly, called Richard Jensen, um, was then a leader of the Danish Seafarers Union, and he wrote a book that countered Valtin's account. He said that Out of the Night was 99% free fantasy, although Jensen's book also has its own problems um, of objectivity. Um, Jensen writes that Krebs, in his last chapter, uh, cl claims that he fled Jensen, uh, who'd held him imprisoned uh, in a summer house. Um, Krebs writes that, uh, Krebs or Valtin writes that he set the house on fire as he made his way uh, away on, on board the ship. Um, he said that he took a ferry uh, from one uh, in Jutland, but Jensen says that it must have been um, a, a ghost ship. Um, uh, waiting for him as the ferry service stopped in, on the 14th of May 1935 when the bridge was opened only two years, over two years previously. Um, not only the summer house, but uh, Kre Krebs claimed that the Gestapo caught him on 30th November 1933 and broke him 101 days later. 
Um, we can't say whether this was true or not. Um, um, but um, this has later been dis this has later been disputed by by other historians. I'll, I'll come come on to. Um, Jensen, on the other hand, states that uh, the Gestapo quickly broke Krebs, and this has also led to a wave of arrests uh, in German ports where Krebs had, uh, or Balton had operated. Um, for 1934 to 1936, uh, absolutely reliable information from the trade union organisations that Krebs uh, had been a Gestapo agent or a Gestapo informant in the concentration camp much before Krebs, uh, many years before Krebs claims that he, he became a uh, Gestapo agent. Um, um, uh, as when he was, when he was um, uh, taken into custody by the Gestapo, uh, by the, uh, after Hitler's rise to power. Um, Jensen's suspicions at the time uh, and later claims were given credence by uh, research carried out by the Danish historian uh, Eric Norgard. He, claim, he claimed from police and court records that Krebs was arrested on 9th of November 1933 and there was 21 days of uh, discrepancy in Krebs's own account. Um, there are, there are small, smaller uh, discrepancies, for example, again, uh, Krebs talks of an old Singer car rather than actually a new Renault. Um, uh, uh, and he talks about certain women uh, as a uh, sex-mad man-eater, when in fact that Jensen claimed that she, they were mild and friendly women. Um, uh, According to Jensen, at first, uh, Danes believed that Krebs was booked, um, but the Gestapo had interrogated for Jensen for weeks, uh, and on circumstantial evidence, he was sentenced for 16 years of hard labour. Um, Jensen claimed that this, with a with rich list of names, addresses, and details of the book, um, that, that the Gestapo used actually against Jensen when he was arrested. Um, the book, uh, Balsen's book, was actually used in all occupied countries uh, as a source for the forces of repression um, because of the detailed nature of the names and addresses. Um, and this came out in France as well, which um, was a large scandal because a number of people who were mentioned uh, went on to be leading government ministers or le leading, figures in, leading figures in the post-war government. Um, Jensen's argument, and I think we need to take this seriously, is that out of the night memoir takes real people, real, fa real facts and events a weaves a serious a story out of it that tries to make uh, 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 one belt in and more uh, tries to close down possible avenues in which uh, he could be criticised, but also to uh, make the story more um, read readable for American, American audiences. Um, so, but I think this doesn't uh, discount the fact that it's a, it's a serious book that we need to take seriously, which, we, um, which we're lucky to have a memoir from inside the Communist International, um, not from it, one of its leaders or one of its middle banking functionaries, many of which lost their lives uh, under, the, under, the, uh, under the Nazis' uh, repression, but also uh, uh, under Stalin as well. Um, so it's very, very rare that we have uh, such a first-hand account, but we need to take it uh, with a pinch of salt. Um, we need to treat it like any other historical document that's, that's coloured by biases um, uh, and, and, and silences. Um, on, on, the, on the criticism by, at the time, Karl Korsch, who was a, who was a, uh, a Marxist theoretician, an ex-Communist um, Party uh, <coughs> Germany leader, um, who was expelled for ultra-leftism in 1926. He wrote of Out of the Night um, that Krebs was hardly a Democrat, who he was framed as by his American publishers um, um, and his fans amongst the US intelligentsia. Um, Korsh considered Valtin an ex-GP, an ex-Russian uh, Secret Service, an ex-Gestapo, an ex-double agent who uh, fled to the USA once pressure in Europe uh, was too great. Um, Referring to Krebs's pretended conversion to Nazism, Korsh quotes from the Out of Night to prove his point. Um, this is Baltin writes at the end, when he justifies becoming a double agent for, for the fascists. Many of the things I said were not lies. They were conclusions I had arrived at in self-searching and digging in which many thousand lonely hours had, had invited. 
I joined the Communist Party as a boy out of the same motives which brought other youths into the ranks of the Hitler movement. Um, which calls into question uh, Valtin's motives of getting in, involved in, in the Communists in the first place. Um, and this is Korsh's major argument, that in fact uh, he was never um, really committed to Communism uh, at all. Um, this same point uh, is, is, is made again by John Wright, who says that the major uh, weakness of uh, Valtin's account is that there is very little politics. Uh, drawn from Bolshevism by his emotions, Wright uh, uh, <coughs> writes, uh, he failed to develop beyond his initial and elementary stage of revolutionary activity. Throughout his narrative, Valtin does not so much as attempt to draw a single political lesson, Wright writes. There is, no, there is no answer to any burning questions, no hint or any desire to see for a political evaluation of any of his experiences. No matter what happens, there's always a blind, cynical acceptance of the Kremlin's orders. Um, this is exemplified best when Valtin first learns the new change of policy of the Popular Front um, while he's in uh, one of Hitler's jails. Turning on his head the uh, previous policy of what's called the Third Period, um, uh, as thousands of German Bolsheviks had fought for, including Valtin, a uh, man many had died to defend. Um, through the lips of one of his comrades, also in jail, he reports, uh, the Comintern policy has been modified. It's now the popular front. We defend democracy because democracy gives us the best chance of organizing the armed insurrection, an important tactical maneuver that many of the comrades here are bitter about having gone to prison for a policy that's now declared erroneous by Moscow. This points to a wider culture inside the common term which repressed debate and stressed unity and party discipline at all costs. Once he is freed from San Quentin, the prison in which he um, was in, in, in America, who, as he was uh, accosted, he was, he was asked by one of the common term agents to, uh, to conduct an assassination, which he, he then botched and had to do, uh, to, what, a thousand days in prison. Um, during the, the key factional struggles in the Comintern in the mid-1920s. When he returns in 1929 uh, to party activity, he's warned by one of his uh, comrades in the harbour, uh, be careful about what you say when you meet up with comrades higher up. You've been away a long time. The Comintern has changed its face. It has been unified. It's now going like a torpedo, one direction only. No more internal discussions, no more compromise. I was to learn, Comments Valentin, much more about this change of face during the coming weeks. Zinoviev and Trotsky had been purged. Bukharin was pushed away from the helm of the Comintern. Stalin now dominated Russia and therefore the Comintern as well. And with this, um, I come to, come to the end. Um, I want to end on a slightly more reflective note of what Valentin's uh, memoirs can tell us um, as uh, can tell us. Uh, today about uh, left strategy in the future. Um, I, when I was reading, um, well, when I came across a quote by uh, the Belgian communist uh, Ernst Mandel, uh, he was asked on his way out of a conference in the late 1980s uh, in uh, the GDR, how is it that someone like you does not experience doubt? Um, and Mandel replied, of course I experience doubt, scientific doubt, but I have no moral doubt. I've explained this distinction clearly. Science is based on doubt. Science is based on constructive doubt, whereas moral commitment is not. I doubt everything that is based upon intellectual belief and on facts, since that is always unliable to change when new facts and new ideas and experiences arise. But moral commitment, to be on side of the oppressed and the exploited, that is a categorical imperative, as Marx said. And about that, there can be no doubt. It's a lifelong commitment. Brecht, however, understood that even this commitment to the oppressed was not to be enough. Many lives of communists, not just Valtins, have ended in failure, betrayal, and disillusion. In many instances, transforming an original ideal uh, and commitment to justice into political practice that upheld its opposite. Echoing the question Brecht posed in, the, in his play, The Measures Taken, uh, from 19, 1930, uh, during the Comintern's third period, Valtin and his generation asked, what baseness would you not commit to stamp out baseness? If you could change the world, what would you be too good for? Sink into the mire, embrace the butcher, but change the world. It needs it.
Yet describing Jan Valtin's generation of interwar communists in his poem to posterity, um, uh, nine or ten years later, Brecht would sound a very, very different note. For we, know for we knew too well, Brecht wrote, even the hatred of squalor makes the brow grow stern. Even the anger against injustice makes the voice grow harsh. Alas, we who wish to lay the foundations of kindness could not ourselves be kind. But you, and at last time comes to pass, that man can help his fellow man. Do not judge us too harshly. Coming to terms with the left's past means refusing to forget past like Valtins, nor to judge them too harshly. Instead, in the 20th century communist experience, we must, as Walter Benjamin urged, take control of a memory as it flashes in a moment of danger. It means recovering amongst the wreckage a salvageable past, not to be showcased as a museum piece, but as a living, breathing element of present and future struggles. It is out of this material that a tradition of the 21st century left can be built. As French socialist Jean Chavez uh, rightly talked, he said, transition should not be the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. It is in the lives of those millions of militants who fought and expecting to storm heaven like Valtin, uh, as Mount Marx talked of the Paris Commune, communards, that a new left in the 21st century can be built. It's coming to terms with this past, the defeat and also the hopes of Jan Valtin's generation, which help us move towards a future of our own making. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, who would you like to start? Uh, maybe he would like to be first. It doesn't, okay. first uh, when I read the book, I read it because one of the Turkish guys had talked about the book. Mm -hmm. Um, he was translating it, and in the meantime, I was reading the Buhari's wife's memoirs, and then uh, Mark Paul's uh, memoirs. It was really interesting, these books. Mm. And I ordered from the internet, by luck, second then, by luck, I had the book with out of, uh, end of, uh, end of book notes. Mm. There was a good essay at the end of my book, mm -hmm. good essay from the uh, 1970s militants from Manchester, and uh, they have a team, uh, and uh, they really dig out all the details and all the discussion, mm -hmm. John Wright and others, all the Twitch guides in the 1940s. Yeah. And uh, what really... The, the, text that you read out, for instance, mm. it is not the sailor's words, mm. you can see. Yeah. And his education is not really uh, high education, mm. the text is very juicy. Mm. Uh, the, you mentioned the name, Isaac, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And uh, when he had the problem uh, with the FBI, not with the FBI, with the uh, uh, no, 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 no. Checker. No, not Checker. In, in the United States, he had a problem yeah. because of his conviction earlier, 1926. Yeah. Uh, they were, uh, they were uh, targeting him and they were saying that you are a Gestapo agent, mm -hmm. German agent, as well as you are a convicted criminal. We do not accept you. We're going to yeah. kick you out. That, that was a problem. Then, uh, what, what was the name? The, an American. Uh, an American, what's it? Committee, Activities Committee. Yeah. Uh, it was a different name that time. Uh, uh, American. Something like that. Then, uh, Senator asked Isaac, blah, blah, to contact this guy. Mm -hmm. Because that time, Roosevelt was moving towards to Stalin, encouraging all these things. What I'm trying to say, I, I know I'm talking too long. I was about to yeah. stop you then. Yeah. At the end of the day, Isaac paid ten dollars to him every week, and he wrote thousands of pages in English and in German. And out of that, this book came. Isaac edited the book for six months. That's how it is so juicy. There are facts. As a historian, as a political historian, we have to look at those. Uh, evidence, these kind of evidence, really, really carefully. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't take face yeah. value face of it. Face value of it. And after I read that, I had, after I read that essay, mm -hmm. 
I reread the book. I found that because I'm really, uh, how, how can I say, this is my story too, partially. That's why I was. That's why I was saying, what a nice thing to these things coming from 1920s. Mm. But maybe romantic part was there, not, not the real, real elements, the concrete elements were there. That's the problem, mm. and it put me that doubt in my mind. Mm. That therefore, I'm not dismissing the book. But with doubt, I cannot, uh, I cannot take this book so seriously. Mm -hmm. That's my, that's my uh, view. Any other points, questions or comments? Can I say something? I, I have a question. Okay. Okay. No. Sorry about that. Yeah. I didn't ask a question. <coughs> Go on. Have you got any conclusions? Got any conclusions? Having, having read it, any conclusions how to how to act politically mm. yourself? And the, and how did you come in, become interested in reading it? Um, thank you. But I add something. From my point of view, to make it easier for yeah. you, uh, same as you, I mean, I'm, I'm involved. In it. I was, I had a friend in the GDR in the 80s, whom I saw frequently. He was um, teaching urban planning in Weimar at the university, and he became deputy head <coughs> of the Institute of Planning. Central Institute. <coughs> and <coughs> we had a big meeting with uh, an organization which Lynn had created, the production of the built environment in Dessau, discussing planning issues. And that was with this particular friend, Bernd Grünwald. And I remember I went on a walk with him. We talked very openly about the problems of the socialist state. And uh, he was very concerned. It was in 1986. And he then a few times came to West Germany and started negotiating with the German government. And, uh, and at the last time he was there, he gave me a call and I had great concerns about him. And a few days later he took his life. That was after the fall of the war. Just a few months after the war. You know, that's the things which we did experience. And I must say the, the, uh, the socialist state in the GDR was so multifaceted from what I experienced. There were very positive parts of it, aspects of it. And then there was this central state planning, which most of my friends in the GDR were very skeptical about. And Wolf, for instance, I regard him as a very genuine socialist. Mm -hmm. Very genuine socialist. To the end of his life. Yeah. But within the um, the socialist system, what do you do? Or now you're outside the socialist system. I really want to know what, and let's, let's discuss what we need to do. I have been in the Communist Party. I have been, I'm now in the Labour Party, by the way. Um, I have been in Germany in the Communist Party. I haven't done Germany been. I mean, or I, left all parties and then I thought, no, I must, be, I must do something. But the West German Communist Party was so doctrinaire, you couldn't stand it. Anyway, I, we are all in these dilemmas, and you have been reading this book, that's why I'm asking, what, how do you come to read it, and what's your conclusion? I, have, that's, I, I told this my story, and I would like to hear something from your point of view, which touches upon your mm. personal experience in this dilemma. 
I think, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I'd love to answer that. But the honest answer is that I, I really wanted to read this book and I, I fell in love with this book, not because of Valtin himself, but because it was recommended to me by you all. Um, and what was extraordinary for me, actually, and why I wanted to read it, was why the way Ishmael talked about it was as a, an experience, as, and where you talk about it, as our history as well. I find that really quite powerful. Uh, the fact that you can read a book, but also read your own experiences into it. It's the left's history as our collective history. And I feel unless we come to terms with that collective history, the fact that this world doesn't seem to exist, that my generation of socialists don't live in the same world, um, but we also feel, but we also feel like a deep connection. And I, I wonder how. Um, <coughs> I really wanted to get to the bottom of why, how you can look to the past to explain your own experiences. Um, um, so that, so it, it was actually, it was the reason why other people felt the book was so important to them that actually made me want to understand, understand it. There's the experience of in, in, in the Turkish party uh, and the experience of Altin, that, that was something I would, if you wanted to talk more about, I, I don't know, um, but you were describing that before. In terms of uh, what, uh, in terms of my conclusions, um, I think, as as I said, as I said at the end, uh, with a quote from Walter Benjamin, unless we come to terms with this experience of defeat, of the fact that Jan Galtin. Did you uh, quote uh, Walter Benjamin? Walter Benjamin. Yeah, no, but, but what was? I said. Did you um, to Walter Benjamin? I said um, history is not. Well, he he says in. His, oh, yes. Yeah, see, it means history, our, our approach to the past, um, means, uh, means taking control of a memory as it flashes in a moment of danger. It doesn't mean reconstructing history um, as it really was, but it actually means recovering in the past, a salvageable tradition in which we can move forward with today. And so it's not so much was Valtin right when he said, use this date or that? Was he right in his portrayal of Ernst Volbe? But it's, this is why I really wanted to stress the individuals and their hopes and their dreams, going to the Galapagos and forming a Soviet or being a gun runner and be, be having such creative imagination and, 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 and which infused their revolutionary commitment. Why the individual story is so important is that it's in that that we can recover a spirit, or like a revolutionary spirit today, to understand that this is our tradition. Understand that there was um, all the contradictions, like I said, with Brecht and the Mandel quote, that you can have this commitment to the oppressed as a categorical imperative, but also that commitment to the oppressed doesn't can also make can also carry its own contradictions. Um, but that in this past, like Valentin's and the Hebrew accounts, there is there's something we have to recover. But what we recover, what we recover in the socialist project of the 20th century, that's, I think, our key. Uh, that's it, that's it. It's yeah. absolutely central. Yeah. Um, but what we do, I think, that, <laughs> and that needs to infuse ev every struggle that we're conducting at the present. But there are other aspects. I, think I agree with all this, and I agree with your concern that this is really important to think from to today what we get from yeah. these experiences, but there are many different ways of reading a book like this. And because of my own work, I'm a historian, I studied the 1920s, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the two decades afterwards, right? And I read so many of similar books of Russian communists, Azerbaijani communists, Ukrainian communists, all lived in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, during the Stalin period, and so many to, to Turkish communists in that period. And almost of knows there are maybe about like 40, 50 <coughs> similar books, uh, uh, but all experience in that region. And this is from Europe, and those were in the Caucasus, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, and, and Russia. Uh, the, the first aspect is a historian, as a historian who is also interested in Marxism and who believes in Marxism and who would like to get something from today's conditions. Uh, the first thing I look at in reading this book, and this is what I was trying to get from what you said. First of all, how accurate are the things? 
Ali Mustafa karşıtı size Ali Vember do one day my PhD and, and after every time when I was reading this I was also trying to check maybe almost like a detective uh, work trying to check all the things uh, through internet now and in, in the past going to library, reading all those journals, magazines of that period, and seeing any other references. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then, it, most of the time it is possible to check things. And then, uh, most of the people, similar to Walton, they romanticize and exaggerate for the sake of romanticism, mm -hmm. most of the details. So, but this is important for us not to reject this altogether, mm -hmm. but to understand exactly what is based on truth and to what extent they exaggerate or they change or they romanticize. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the, the first thing. This doesn't take anything away from the whole atmosphere, memory, mm -hmm. legacy, sacrifice, uh, but makes it more real and also makes it easier for us to learn something from mm -hmm. the past, not just copy it without uh, really uh, understanding whether they were telling mm -hmm. the truth or they were exaggerating or they heard this from second or third mm -hmm. uh, source. So, so, Sources. And second thing is, which I completely agree when you mentioned about how Karl Korsch uh, described this book, and Karl Korsch is a very important person. I think mean, I still read Karl Korsch every time when I'm struggling with some analysis, I go and read uh, one of the books. Like, just like Gramsci, say, yeah. Yeah. In, in, yeah. 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 Yeah, of course. And there are so many articles as well, because at some point, I think in the 1980s and, and 90s, a certain section of the British left was very much interested in Karl Korsch. New and, yeah, so in, in mm -hmm. New, new mm -hmm. Review, there are so many, I think, pieces on, on him, uh, or about him, or about what he wrote, uh, certain sections. For instance, what he said about this book is, yes, they are very interesting, and it, it gives up the feeling of a, sort of a period where uh, people sacrifice themselves for a, uh, a, a cause, mm -hmm. uh, for a, just for a cause, but there's no political analysis. Mm -hmm. he, he has no he has no perspective mm. in terms of politics. He obviously believed, mm. and he thought it was worthwhile to sacrifice his life mm. and to do all those I I amazing things, but he doesn't have a clear perspective. Mm. So for, for that reason, I think there are so many similar <coughs> stories. For instance, I, I remember some Russian communists from the 1920s, they played a very important role in the Bolshevik Revolution, but then, after a while, after some clashes with something, they just moved on to the other side. Again, they were doing exactly similar things for a completely different <coughs> ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, so this shows a particular, particular person, particular personality. Mm -hmm. And it's a personality which is very useful, very, very important, very valuable for a for fighting for a good cause. But the same personality, without any clear political perspective can be used or manipulated for a completely wrong cause. Mm -hmm. That's totally. Yeah, I know I very much agree. This one? Yeah, there is a point of discussion in exactly what you said there. If it was only this guy who had written his memoirs, we could have uh, just stayed there and just accuse him for saying these and not saying the other things and so on. But there are many other things. One of the other uh, persons who have uh, written uh, memoirs is uh, Otto Kuzinen's wife, mm -hmm. Aino Kuzinen. She was one of the, uh, how do you say, stalwarts of the Communist International he was, she was in the Stalin circle. Uh, Kuzinen was the second man after Stalin in many ways. And she was working with Richard Sorge in, in Japan. Suddenly, she is invited back to Moscow. Richard Sorge has been uh, executed as a Trotskyite agent. And she's been tortured. Now, when I read the book, I was amazed how resistant can people be to the treatment they have received. Uh, Otto Kuzinen is still at the head of the uh, Communist International. She is arrested. He doesn't lift his finger at all. 
he cannot lift his finger. Anyway, the the whole story how Stalin died and even after Stalin's death, they don't let her free. She fights and fights and fights at the very end. She says, I'm finished. I want to go to Finland. Let me out. They say, well, you can't write your memoirs. She says, of course I am going to write my memoirs. All right, they say at the very end. You can write your memoirs, but it will be published only after your death. And I have read her memoirs a couple of years, which were printed a couple of years after uh, she died in German. And then it came in English and many other languages. But uh, the uh, issue is this. Lots of people don't talk about her because he is sort of revolutionary with all the his name again. I knew Kuzinen. Kuzinen's wife. Otto wine. Kuzinen's wife. Otto Kuzinen is the... Uh, we, we learned communism from Otto Kuzinen when in 1979, uh, 69, 70s, because he was one of the first books translated into Turkish. Kuzinen. Otto Kuzinen. Yeah. Kuzinen. He is Finnish. Finnish Kuzinen. He is not an important uh, theoretically or practically important person. We learn much later. But he, his book was one of the first. That's why we know his name. Otherwise, maybe we wouldn't know. The, 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 this guy is a full revolutionary. He doesn't think in uh, political, uh, theoretical terms. He doesn't sit and make lots of evaluations yeah. theoretically. But he is, he is rank and file communist. So they tell him, do this. He has full belief, true believers, and he is full revolutionary. He goes wherever he goes. I am sure in our periods of our life, we've done more or less the same things uh, in different measures, in different places. But we've done more or less the same things. There is a point where you might be broken. It is a question whether you are going to go to the other side of the river or stay on this side of the river. Uh, I think he didn't write more about internal discussions because he still wanted to be live, live as a communist somehow. He could have written many things about internal party struggles, but then he would have damaged something. So he didn't write about that. He has written many things, but well, I learned a lot about uh, why GDR was the GDR we know because of this book, mm. the, uh, when the Nazis, <laughs> you know? the Nazis attacked the, uh, the uh, Communist Party uh, Central, this uh, historian Hobsbawm was mm. 16 years old. He was go walking around the area when he came afterwards. He escaped. This guy uh, is telling that after the Communist Party uh, center has been raided by the SS and all the other st uh, state troops. The general secretary Talheim mm -hmm. arrested. There is only one person left, uh, Ernst Vorweber. He is the he was the head of the uh, illegal apparatus, mm -hmm. so he took over. He continued organizing and resisting under the uh, Nazi regime, Second World War, and after the Second World War, he was one of the first bricklayers of GDR. But being a being a illegal party leader makes you psychopath, paranoiac, uh, you are... Power you, you are... You have full power, you can do whatever you like. So he has contributed to the uh, image of the GDR when it was 
uh, established. That is why maybe GDR had Stasi. GDR had lots of problems, but Stasi, I'm sure, in a way, I feel like that, that it was the brainchild of this man, most probably, because he was the secret uh, organization's leader. He has been also disqualified afterwards. He's been even thrown out of the party later because of his fixations. You can't, you cannot help it. Uh, it is not easy. Uh, so it has informed me a lot. When you read Marcus Wolff's uh, memoirs, I know Kuzinan's memoirs, and this guy, all of them are communists. So they are not speaking from the other side's view. They are speaking from our side. So uh, there are lots of things to learn from these for the future. But for the first, the first thing to learn is that you have to be sacrificial. You have to have high level of idealization. You have to be resistant to incredible difficulties and horrible fates. He has been telling them many stories where Polish uh, communists in the West being chopped off head and so on. We see that in Indonesia, we see in Iraq, Syria, wherever, even in Turkey, lots of people have been imprisoned and tortured to death. So uh, we learn many things. But there are some political things here as well we should uh, be uh, talking about. For example, why German communists called social democrats as social fascists? Why did they attack socialists more than Nazis at the beginning? Because Nazis was a small party, socialists were a huge conglomerate. So they attacked them. They destroyed the trade union meetings of social democrats because they were social fascists. So we have to think about this uh, ideology of uh, uh, calling, uh, naming, others. naming others as social fascists, like social democrats. Well, it's not so uh, difficult not to say that in today's Turkey, but... Uh, Our generation and the Sky generation, we almost 50 years uh, later, we can see many similarity in the, our political past. Even which is uh, interesting mostly is the uh, all leftist party from the communists to social democrats fight each other. Then in the uh, trade in the trade unions, in the street, in the party congress or whatever, the fasc fascists and Nazis going up. And similar things and uh, they cheat each, uh, each other. And the similar things in the uh, 60s, 70s in Turkey, when uh, the, we fight the politically in the, in the illegal party, we had the same problem. And also inside the illegal party, uh, nobody knows, but we know, uh, everybody knows actually, there are a number of different groups in the parties. Everybody tackling to others. Because somebody say it's a Soviet Union saying something, the motherland for socialism, which is illusion. We didn't know in that time. And he he said same thing. But he doesn't know before. If you see in the first stage in the ball book, he say to all comrades like a van, they collect each other very strong. And after that, in a couple of years, early 30s, it's like changing something. I think I remember maybe after when he get out to prison in the first time. But changing. They say he couldn't understand what's going on. There is some somebody called something, uh, starting to say something, and they are blaming them with Trotsky or something like that. Then corruption. And if you see the, your party life in Turkey or whatever in the South America, you can see the same picture after 50 years later. But believe, 
That, it's very strange. Uh, okay. No. Uh, no, no, no. I'm in the middle of reading this book, <laughs> but uh, just not get into enough because it's really huge. I will say a few things. When you look at a human being, how it evolves, uh, we do ourselves as an individual evolve in the environment that we are in. Uh, this starts from the uh, family and then school and school environment, uh, the effect of the um, pairs, uh, friends, and so on and so forth. Party is not a separate identity, it's not separate something. Yes, it is separate in a way, and you expect from your uh, party members, comrades, very different attitude. But it's idealistic when you start to expect them to be acting uh, like in a cocoon, the party is uh, ideologically changed them and so on. Yes, ideologically all changed, but at the same time, who was put forward up most of the people who know how to market in themselves. I mean, that's what I mostly see in my own practice. Even uh, the late comrade Bedir, I said to Bedir, he was speaking about somebody, I said, look Bedir, if you give him a couple of days out of the party, he will be such and such. But he's now pushing himself in the front, and then you can see him that he's a great um, I, I, I did, uh, a great um, guy. Uh, basically, he wasn't. I know, I see it. And the past, the present, the, um, uh, in the process, I see him how he dismantled. Another point, when I was working in the Midas Action Group, I was working with two comrades. Two of them were coming from a different country. And two of them were anarchist background and quite uh, happy with being anarchist. One was very young and uh, from Chile. He killed a lot of communists with the war and was happy about that. So after the Chilean uh, to take over, he came to Paris because he's extremely clever. He become a um, three three play. What do you call it? In the street, you open the cards, and where's the money, and etc. And he start to survive through that. And then the, uh, the other comrade who was coming from uh, Bogota, the, um, Colombia, Colombia uh, with the wife, they see uh, him, uh, and then because they are Latin Americans, and they start to talk about it, and uh, they do realize he's a very clever guy. They said, come with us to Britain. Uh, the wife is in a very important position in this country. So they took, uh, took him here. And the, a comrade from the Bogoto, the, the Bogoto threw his passport into the sea without him to seeing it. He was willing to go back to Paris and start to play the cards and etc. They said, no, you will stay in Britain. Your passport is in the sea. You can't take it out. So you have to stay and study. And he did, really. And he became a different man. While we were working hard, he was very, very clever and very quick. And he did a lot of good job. But in particularly, if you look at the, from a moral aspect, in terms of the, what state imposes on, on us, they had no rule. Stealing, stealing, killing, killing. Very different personalities, but in the revolutionary movement, they play a great role because their heart is with the revolution, with the side of the uh, oppressed, not with the oppressors. So this is always happens, whether it is in the Communist Party, whether it is in the anarchist movement, whether it is in here and there. You can always see some people are extremely good for supporting others, 
and then some people are extremely good taking all the benefits to their side. I think what you explain about the, all these people, one come from the sea, the other come from such and such place, the Bandura and so on, so mm -hmm. it's really, I smile because I come across these people mm. and work with them. Mm. If you say it to yourself, no, that this is rubbish, these people are not my mm -hmm. calibre, mm -hmm. you can't work. Um, when you see that they are doing a good job, you work with them, you cooperate with them, so you are doing something. They influence by you, you influence by them. That's always the case. But is it, is it the case? I mean, you all, the uh, mentioned that we heard from you from this period, and you mentioned the divisions within the left has always been there, uh, especially after the Russian Revolution. <laughs> the divisions, I mean, they, they sacrificed themselves, fought together, and then you saw Mensheviks went this way, Estars went this way, I and mean, they became enemies. They started killing each other. And we, we, we lived this in Turkey. Uh, I mean, some of our closest comrades were killed by Maoist organizations, and, and our comrades uh, co committed similar violence against the other left organizations. For, for what? I mean, it is easy for us to say that they all sacrifice for, and they are all on the side of the oppressed, but what does it mean on the side of the oppressed? For instance, even here, now, I mean, I am a member of the Labour Party because of Jeremy Corbyn as well, but when you look at the Labour Party and peace, Social yeah. fascists. Yeah, I mean, for instance, <coughs> voting, bombing uh, Syria, bombing Iraq, uh, is, is this to be on the side of the oppressed? But I am a member of that, that party, and some of my MPs is doing this. So it is much more complicated than this. I mean, what I am saying is, what was missing, and what is still missing in the left organization, first of all, a understanding and compromise to each other, and to find a general platform which is, in a very general way, to be on the right side, to be on the right cause. Which most of the history of uh, communist history, which was missing. Uh, in almost every single country, there were always violence and fights against each other, more than against uh, actual uh, representatives of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> and, so, uh, what I can say as a conclusion of this, maybe two things have, has to go together. One is a proper understanding of the system, of the society, and on the basis of this, a good socialist plan, project, on which majority of the left-wing people should agree and work together. And on the other side, we need people like Walden, uh, like, who are willing to sacrifice themselves for this cause. But if we, if we neglect the first side, if we don't have the first side, then we always have people like him. I mean, here there are so many people I see in this country against racism, against war, uh, against austerity. I mean, in every town, I mean, recently I witnessed in my place, in Stockholm Trent, uh, there are hundreds of people, mainly young people, they are willing to do everything. To, for the right cause. But if you don't have the, the first part, the proper planning and the proper strategy and the policy, then we look like running around like headless chickens. We just waste our energies. I was, I was continuing about Please. other points. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not the person that I prepared something, so it is very difficult, it is very patchy. Uh, another issue we need to think about how to acquire knowledge. My, talk, my training is on social anthropology, so it's a very important topic there. Uh, in a village society, in a small scale society, who's running the society? Mostly the elders. Because elders, everything, including bride price, Bashik Parasi, is related oh. with how to get the hand on the young people's labor. Why? Why the older people interested in getting the younger people labor is because 
they want to get the knowledge to lead the society. Where to go? This side, that side. If they go this side and they can't find the water, for example, all this uh, livestock as well as the people may die. So they need the knowledge. Again, here, if you are a very committed comrade, <coughs> you are not unfortunately knowledge in a way, in a more systematic way. Whatever the party teaches you, you understand. Mm -hmm. And the party teaches you very high level of information and knowledge. And you you can't chew it because you have no the background. If this background is there, you can understand better, you can uh, assimilate it, you can come to a synthesis and you can own it. But it is not like that. Party doesn't give you, when you're a committed person, party doesn't give you enough time to do something. When you have time and you can learn, parties, unfortunately, people who are in the top in terms of leading capacity, have the leading capacity, immediately get uh, alerted. And they start, I mean, this happened to me. And I said that I'm working, but I wasn't working. I was completely reading the newspapers, taking the uh, summaries, and uh, getting some understanding, reading books, and the party people didn't like it. They immediately get, well, you know, what's happening type of things. Well, you have touched on a really important point. Maybe Mustafa should say something on this, because a another thing I, 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 which reminded me, they are talking about communist history. Yes. Communist history is not something happens just in just like in isolation. Communist history was a particular communist history. For the majority of the time, until 1991 and this this period, that was Soviet Union. And the, the first part of the period there was common term, that common form, but even after common form there was a still a dominant Soviet control for the majority no, of the other communist parties. Yeah. So Mustafa is looking at the Think how the communist parties, but how the communist parties act. Are they agents of revolution or are they just foreign policy instruments of the Soviet Union as a big powerful state? I mean, from my reading, uh, I've been reading quite a while, uh, not only the PhD period, but I found out uh, most of communist parties, even uh, uh, from the first uh, Union of the Communist Movement, where Karl Marx established in London. Uh, most of the Communist Movement were looking for the uh, authority to act, authority to create plan, planning and that. When I look at the 1943 Com Turkish Communist Party, Turkish Communist Party were sort of uh, decentralized and ineffective from 1935 onwards, completely ineffective. In 1943, just before the Cominterners sort of Bus. shut down, mm -hmm. uh, somehow, I can understand somehow, uh, Dimitro was sending messages uh, directly to all the communist parties all over the world, saying that we are shutting down the communist Coming uh, term, but we're going to carry on yeah. with another form. In another form, your contact will be Soviet Communist Party yeah. or Soviet Union yeah. for a uh, Central Committee. A member, that A member was uh, in the Foreign Office, uh, controlling the Foreign Office. And uh, our leader, uh, Shefik Yusuf, uh, had a communication, then he called other communists, then they start acting. We are looking at the program in 1943. That 1943 program was not a communist program. It was a uh, democratic program uh, resembling the Churchill's, uh, Roosevelt's, Stalin agreement. It wasn't a communist program. And when we look at the 1970s, Church Communist Party program again, was it a communist party program? No, it wasn't. It was, a, again, bourgeois democratic program. Proper bourgeois democratic program. Because that is what Soviet That is what Soviet wanted. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Soviet Union didn't want to have communist state next to it. Because another communist state would have uh, triggered the imperialists to 
jump on that. And that uh, soft uh, barrier would have been demolished. Mm. That's why we communists in Turkey, we communists in uh, Greece, we communists in Lebanon, in, in Iran, uh, Iran in were Greece. suffered exactly. enormously. In we had, uh, in, in Egypt, mm. we suffered enormously. We did not understand what's going on. We were shooting each other. Uh, and also, as a result of this, in day-to-day -day life, when, when we all became uh, activists in the communist movement in our youth, in, from high school or, or onwards, we realized we cannot compete against independent left-wing organizations. Because we had to defend one very strict policy, which is serving Soviet foreign policy interests, but the others are fighting for revolution in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So we were stopped from saying things, and therefore we kept losing people. Mm -hmm. And we remained as a limited organization, mainly because of this control from Moscow. Yeah. I mean, Moscow didn't, wasn't controlling us one by one, but by imposing a certain program upon a large number of co communist parties, uh, and basically now we can see from today in retrospect, they did not want a revolution, a revolution in, in uh, a large number of countries after 1920s. Once they stabilized the Soviet state, once, especially after the Second World War, once, once, once they secured Soviet state and secured the Eastern European uh, zone, safety zone, they didn't want to change the balance, to, to, to risk the balance. This major problem, that I guess, is the state and communist uh, movement merge each other. That communism not priority anymore for the Soviet Union, Soviet state the priority for the party. Because, just remember, in the, in the 1980s, in the military coup, Soviet says to Turkey, what? Yes. They, uh, they support the junta. That's what I was going to say. I mean, yeah. That's what's happening today as well. Yeah, that's the uh, that's Communism in some... Communist party after the uh, and Kenan Evren shake hands. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the major, main problem. This the communist idea and uh, getting under the control by the Soviet state. So this, <coughs> this, main, is, main the, land this is, is kind of, this brought us to the point of what Trotsky wanted. Mm -hmm. I mean, socialism in one country idea was not a revolutionary idea. Yeah. No. yeah. That's, 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 so when, when we talk about Trotsky, we should give the uh, how do you say uh, the right uh, value of Trotsky as well? Trotsky is the person who said that capitalism no longer develops uh, productive forces in 1939. Yeah, that's, that's another problem. That is that is the political death, yeah. theoretical death of any communist. And Stalin copied what he said. He said to communists in the uh, big uh, congress after the war, he said, I think it was 1947 uh, or 50. I'm Forty not sure. sure. I'm not sure. No, no, no. The Communist Party 19 Congress. Uh, uh, sorry. He okay. says, well, can we say that as Comrade Lenin said, capitalism, under capitalism, uh, the productive forces develop no, of course not. Capitalism cannot develop productive forces. We have socialism. Socialism mm -hmm. will uh, improve the productive forces. Capitalism will fall. Socialism mm -hmm. will be victorious. Mm -hmm. Then he says that is why all the communist parties first and foremost duty is to serve the Soviet Union. Yeah, motherland. That's it. That's it. Then you lost everything. Because he says, everybody will look at me. They will follow me. Uh, well, we know, we know where we have This is in 19 Congress, in, uh, after the war. In 1920, uh, second Congress of the Comintern, Lenin, clashing with Roy, said that we cannot ex 
the export revolution and more. That's finished. Therefore, we have to look at the eastern part of the, uh, Europe. We have to look at the national liberation movement. And then that failed. Again, nine years later. In China it failed. In Turkey it failed. Then what did they do? They demolished the opposition, Stalin, Zinovia, Buharin. They destroyed them. They threw them from the party. And the party became Comintern decision maker and crushing everything, crushing any, any idea, every idea. Because socialism, socialism in my country needs control. They don't need any opposition. They don't need any thinking ideas, thinking brains. They need numbers. And I only ever thought you were this book. I, I was I was thinking of Roy's memoirs. Ah, because exactly. it is on the, because if you put these book together, I mean both of them have really valuable aspects. Yeah. But this book is really valuable in terms of giving the atmosphere, psychology, so many interesting details. And Roy's book is on the other hand policy Post. and perspective and analysis. And I think Roy wrote two memoirs. I remember studying both mm -hmm. of them. I even started translating one of them into Turkish, and then uh, I had to leave to Turkey and mm -hmm. left it to somebody else, which mm -hmm. never translated. Mm -hmm. Two points. Number one, we need to get ideology. Hmm? We need ideology. Do we need to conform with any ideology? I think that's a major point. We don't need to. Uh, seeking for truth doesn't require to be committed to an ideology. But what uh, is ideology? I mean, I, I mean we, are using, we are using the term in a, in a different sense. Because ideology is not a combination of various analysis about the system, the structures, uh, the relationship between various classes, and then policies on top of this. So all this combination makes ideology is not something like coming from, from, from the sky. Right? So it's not like a religious belief. It become like no, no, I mean becomes. in certain in certain conditions in the history, yes, it has become like a religious belief. Like it it, it, it became fixed. Fixed in some things. But ideology doesn't need to be like that, don't you think? Mm. Yeah. It is living, sort of living animal, the, the living, living animal sort but of. But when you say the living animal, does it come from it? It is still ideology, of course, it is still ideology. Ideology of constructing something, planning something. And another point I want to say. Okay. When I read the book from the um, Lenin's, Lenin's jurists, uh, his name is Eugeni Bronislav Poshikanis. And he, uh, he put uh, a theory, which is called the state theory, uh, of uh, commodity production. Okay. And the, this was a book for, against the uh, neocontins. But at the same time, it was a criticism to the left. The book is supreme. I can say. It's just, it opens your mind like that. And uh, he was criticizing Buharin, Ziber, Podlovsky, and so on and so forth. So you do realize that the people who has names like Kamenev, Kamenev Zionev, etc., which we know, perhaps they were very uh, valued and uh, uh, asserting themselves, and maybe also a heroic aspects that they had. But in ideology, when he makes this criticism, and their understanding is very flat. So again, when you look at the history, uh, you say, this is the guy, this is the guy, and then Stalin is killed and blah, blah, blah. Yes, Stalin was wrong. But at the same time, they were also wrong in their understanding. It was not enough to explain the situation that they are in the fruit of the history didn't appeal to them properly. That's what I find out. He smiled. We, 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 
to finally go okay. and then maybe Matt will end. Okay. What I'm going to say is actually not directly related to this. Now, we are in a situation after the fall of the Soviet Union, collapse of the regime. We are in a situation where we have to renew our definitions. Yes. I am mostly interested in the definition of socialism, <clears throat> questioning Lenin's definition in State and Revolution. I find it hardly true now. Secondly, I am interested in uh, clearing uh, the definition of political revolution, social revolution, when we talk about social revolution, political revolution, and the uh, definition of socialism, it will be easier for us to look back and analyze what has happened in history. In Marx, for example, you don't have socialism per se. You have refer referrals to socialism, but he is always talking about communism. Yeah. Socialism is a secondary uh, definition under communism. So uh, then we can easily, for example, say Soviet regime, Soviet style of regime, which had a political revolution, which couldn't continue uh, good enough in social revolution, then it just couldn't go out of law of value workings. It has always been within the uh, universal law of value. So it has never been out of uh, universal law of work values, uh, how do you say, domain. So when we think in these ways, we can come with better definitions and we can look to the future and say that yes, we are revolutionaries, we are going to uh, aim communism, but what we are going to have is what we are going to have under cert certain circumstances. Class struggle will decide uh, whether how democratic we are, how undemocratic we are, but that is where we are going. That's all I can say. Thank you very much, otherwise. I, I want to give it bit of what you asked actually because you asked very concretely about the socialism and the communism. In the English uh, translation there is a 40 page uh, prissy uh, by the Chris Arthur uh, which was my teacher in the Sussex University. Uh, I have a great respect to him because he's, he left his uh, pro professorship in that and he translated the Marx and Engels uh, collected volume and simplified it for the uh, Lawrence and Bishard uh, publication uh, company. And he wrote these 40 pages and he very clearly says that uh, co socialism is the first pe people work according to their ability, they get the according to their ability, right? And then uh, in the communism, there's not such a thing. People get whatever they need according to their need. For example, you have a five child and I have a one child, so the difference needs to place your, your, your need with the five child and I need my need with the one child. But then, of course, I start to question because for many years I struggled on the equal opportunity, which is very precise laws exist in the British history, British law structure. There, what we are discussing, especially uh, the disability, uh, female gender relations, and race equality relations, and etc. There is three type of, of discrimination. One is the direct discrimination. If I say to you, black bastard, you black bastard, uh, there's a direct discrimination. But if I mean it, that uh, you are a man and therefore you discriminate it, uh, you, there's a group discrimination, it's called indirect discrimination. Group discrimination is something is not exists in the law, because law 
in the capitalist society based on individual. We must very carefully think about it. If it's a group discrimination, the law is <coughs> intended. So America calls it class, class, this, uh, class uh, action. It is a class action. Because eşeğin kulağını karpuzu düşürmek gibi bir şey. When we, when, sorry about this. Uh, there is a terminology that don't make the donkey to think about the thing. Exactly. Uh, it's very balance. strange. And, uh, <laughs> it's about donkey's ear. Yeah, and donkey's ear. And donkey's ear. And exactly like that. And when you start to discuss about the group discrimination, you are basically challenging the entire structure of law. And believe me, I'm not just uh, joking. Uh, whenever I come across uh, any difficulties with the trade unions and etc., they say, oh, please don't go into there. We can, uh, we can make the old workers right and etc. They don't want to tackle with the gender discrimination, race discrimination, etc., because they are not equipped and the law is not equipped. Uh, group discrimination is a very, very difficult discrimination because it is based on the class discrimination as well. Once you say the gender discrimination, you why not the class discrimination? When you start to argue, there is no law anymore. So in that sense, what I want to say, I come across uh, these kind of disc discriminations and etc. Then I start to think about well, I am living in Britain, and Britain is a capitalist country, but we are through this equal opportunity uh, struggle opening up a door which is basically uh, is not the uh, income to the people who are uh, according to their ability, according to their need. Because once I'm an able-bodied person, you don't need to spend 10,000 more to do, to do a bigger uh, door for you. And, uh, because there's four or five dis uh, uh, disabled uh, people in the wheelchair. You are so talking about the capitalist structure and the... Uh, yeah, yeah, but... And no, so let, so, let, so let this me, is what, what let, is let, said was completely different. Let, no, let, and let me tie it and up. maybe it's a matter of another topic, because no, no. socialism and uh, communism, these are as two phases later explained no. by Lenin in uh, quite in detailed way. And None no. of these, what you are talking about, has anything to do with that explanation. So it's a kind of ideological thing. They didn't imagine a state and stateless society, and therefore use the socialism in the first phase. There is still a state, but working class is in power, and he called this the so socialist phase. And then when the uh, state completely disappears, but which is going to happen only when the rest of the world becomes socialist, then there will be no state, no police, no authority, then that, that phase is called the communist phase. So, 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 so this is, no. but, but, but uh, uh, I mean, this is so interesting, but I think uh, no, no. We, are, oh, we almost finished the time. I want, I want to give the last word to, I to, to Matt. But I think time no, I, I know, but maybe another, we, we can talk about these phases and then we can talk more on this. Matt. Um, thank you very much, that was a wonderful discussion. Um, I suppose the, the question I want to, I, I want to end, unfortunately, on a, on a question, maybe that is not good for time, but I mean, what struck me from listening to your discussion is that um, what can we take from communist history and our collective history? I think that's the question that, um, that my paper was meant was really trying to ask. I think what came out of our discussion is that how do we come to terms with this collective past? Um, what can we take from the past and what do we have to leave behind? What lessons can we learn? Um, um, is the um, I well, that's an and that's an open question. Um, but I think my generation of people are coming of age in the age of austerity in Britain and in Turkey and around the world. I mean, we are going to have to take from this past its politics, its theory, the symbols, um, but it's also going to have to learn lessons from the past. Um, 
the reason why I chose the individuals is because for me they speak most to what I think of as revolutionary commitment today. It's, I can see myself in them, um, even if the debates are happening and the, uh, at the time I don't quite understand. Um, I, I, they're, they're foreign to me, I can understand the individual person and their commitment and that's I think, um, that's the thing that uh, I connects me connects me to the past. Um, but I think it's, a very, I think it's a, very, a very difficult one. Um, what we need to take, what we need to take from the past. But I think I believe we need to take something. Um, because without a past, there's no, there's going to be no future. Um, so we've got to take that the, the, um, the hopes of the past. But to like with Jan Felton's book, we need to be very keen. Um, with a, with a, with a keep, keenly understanding the contradictions and the, and the problems um, that the previous movements have faced. But yeah, that doesn't mean, but yeah, in, in taking, taking control of our collective past, we can, we, we, we go forward to the future. That's the, that would be my uh, ending note. Well, new so article. I think this is a very appropriate I will, new article, maybe. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you.